Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the Six Writer webinar here at Writer Access. Uh, this month, we will be chatting with Andy Maslin about how to find your voice as a copywriter. Uh, before we begin, please note that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, look for the email later on uh, today or tomorrow morning with these slides for you to download so you can go back and revisit all the interesting tips Andy has for you. Uh, we'll also, at the end of this, we'll be doing a 15-minute Q&A following Andy's 30-minute presentation. So make sure during the presentation or before the Q&A starts, make sure you chat in your questions using the chat box on the GoToWebinar um, sidebar there. Um, you can send those at any time. I'll note them. Uh, if your question doesn't get asked during the Q&A because we have limited time, then I will make sure Andy gets it and see if he has any answers he can send you all on the side. But uh, we will also be live tweeting this webinar. So if you have any questions, you can submit them that way as well, or you can uh, just say hi uh, at the hashtag right on. And without further ado, I am the host, Greg Hunt, the Talent Marketing Manager here at Writer Access. Uh, happy to be with you again this week, month, sorry, not this week, uh, this month I'll be talking with Andy Maslin. Andy is a copywriter, author, trainer, coach. He's the managing director at Sunfish Limited, the CEO of Andy Maslin Copywriting Academy and co-founder of Copy Cabana. Um, I'll let him tell you a little bit more about himself, but you can get in touch with him at Andy Maslin and you should. He has really interesting things to say about copywriting, fiction writing, all sorts of things. So with that, I will turn it over to Andy. Um, thanks, Greg, and hi, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here with you. Um, the only thing I'll add to that um, little description is Copy Cabana is a new conference that I'm co-hosting this September in the south coast of uh, England with uh, Vicky Ross, who's a very well-known advertising copywriter over here. So, you know, bringing some more sort of joy to the copywriting community. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I always like to say, you know, why should you trust me and my, my opinions? You know, I've been writing my whole life. I'm 54 years old now. Um, there's a scrap of paper in my inbox, my intro on my desk with a little story I wrote when I was about five uh, that I keep meaning to sort of photograph and tweet. You know, I used to write for the university newspaper. I wanted to be a journalist originally and, and didn't get into that field and ended up with a job in marketing as a marketing assistant. Uh, where my job was to write copy for direct mail in those days. We're talking about the mid 80s and press and, you know, exhibition materials, all different kinds of things. And, you know, when I say here what the Peter Principle taught me, if you've heard of this, it's the, the idea that everybody gets promoted to their own level of incompetence. And for me, what happened was I was a very good writer, so they kept promoting me. You know, I was a marketing assistant, then an executive, then a manager. And eventually, they, because I was still doing good work, selling lots of stuff, they made me the marketing director, uh, a job for which I'm really not suited at all. I have zero man management skills. I don't really get spreadsheets. I don't want to do budgeting or interviews or disciplinary or forecasting. I just want to write. So in 1995, I think it came pretty clear to everyone that's what the deal was. Uh, a year later, I left to set up my own agency uh, and essentially went back to my first love, which was writing. This is pretty much all I do now. You know, I write and I, I teach um, other writers. If anyone's interested in seeing my style, you can go to that link there, Copywriting Academy, and there's a free 25-minute kind of video seminar just to see what it's like. And obviously, those two web addresses, uh, if you want more about me. Um, I am an author, as Greg said, uh, in, in two sort of fields now. Um, I've written five books on copywriting with traditional publishers. But in the last year, I've started a sort of parallel career as a writer of thrillers in the sort of Jack Reacher vein. Um, as an indie publisher, actually, so I'm doing everything myself. Uh, I just was saying to Greg, I, I typed the words the end um, earlier this morning on novel number four. So if any of you have got any questions about fiction or how tone of voice relates between copy and, and fiction, just let me know. Um, so let's 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 kick off. Um, and really, you know, we have to ask the really big question, um, which is this: Does a copywriter even need to have a voice? Do we need a voice of our own? Isn't the point really that we're chameleons, that we don't have a voice of our own? What we do is we, we have the voice that our clients 
dictate that we have either through tone of voice guidelines or style guide or just what they tell us? And I think the answer is yes, we do. We do need to have a voice. Um, certainly unless you believe that the, the future lies with bots and algorithms and, and things like that. Because beyond plain English, you know, beyond the relentless focus on benefits, what then? What next? You know, how are you going to achieve cut through in a world where, despite what all the pundits were saying 15, 20 years ago, the world is absolutely dominated by writing? Um, it may be that it's something about developing a flair for language. Uh, maybe that's a better word, something to cut through all the garbage out there. And obviously, if you're blogging, if you're writing content on your own behalf, or your own business, or you're writing fiction or whatever, then yes, absolutely, you need something that people relate to, that, that people find engaging emotionally. Because whether they're buying a novel or a bar of soap, it's the emotional engagement that we're looking for. Um, I think the main tip I can give you uh, to find your voice is to read widely. I mean, people have been saying this for centuries. Dr. Johnson, the sort of 18th century British bell lettrist, said the mark of an amateur is someone who writes more than they read. Um, you know, read. But beyond that, yes, let's have a look at these seven tips to find and develop your writer's voice. And the first one I want to talk about is is this one: uh, rhythm. Now. All of these uh, tips, these seven tips I want to give you today, are examples of patterns in writing, really, one way or another. And we love patterns. Uh, as human beings, we like patterns, I think, because they suggest uh, order, and order suggests significance. So if you're a, if you're a prehistoric uh, warrior or villager, random chaotic green background, no significance. A pattern of orange and black stripes, hugely significant. Uh, or red berries, you know, it's going to be something to eat or something that wants to eat us. And that sort of evolutionary uh, reason for searching out patterns comes across in writing as well. You know, it's pleasing on the ear. But writing that has pattern is pleasing. If we find writing pleasing, we're more likely to keep reading. And I think, you know, that is one of the big battles we all face as copywriters is how do we stop somebody switching off, you know, trashing the email, clicking away from the web page or, or binning a piece of direct mail. Um, so in terms of, of rhythm, you know, it's the it's the tumty tum quality of, of, of language. It's what um, poets call meter. Uh, and I want to give you an example uh, from a blog post I wrote for a management consultant that kind of it, illustrates that. In fact, it starts off with another technique altogether called resonance. You know, my heart belongs to daddy, the classics of jazz standard. Um, and it was about uh, a Freudian idea of transference. But it's this first sentence, which uh, let me just grab a pen here. It's just this one here. If I read it out loud to you, leaders lead because they're driven to. That's the conventional wisdom. And you can hear there's a nice beat to it. And it's not obvious. But it does just lull the reader, and it gives them something to get a hold of. So that's a, a, I mean, I'm going to kind of rattle through these, but please, in you know, question time, you, know, you can ask me to sort of elaborate on some of these. The next uh, tip I want to talk about is pacing. Now, uh, everybody learns, I think, as a copywriter very early on in their career that short sentences are the big deal. And yes, it's true. You know, I, I normally teach that for online writing, Eight to ten words on average is, is what you're looking for, maybe 16 for print. <coughs> Excuse me. But that's the point. It is about averages, not absolutes. You know, if you write your copy entirely using short sentences, it gets very choppy, very staccato. Uh, it, it actually raises people's anxiety levels, you know, stress hormones, literally, which is, if, if that's the effect you're going for, is fine. But what we really want to do is to have a sort of a pacing to it, a variation to make it to make it interesting. Um, so here's an example I'm going to put up. It's a speech I wrote um, for the chief nurse at University College London Hospitals. Um, I'll read it out loud to you. The old man knew he was dying. So did the ward sister. He had no friends to talk to, no family to sit with him and hold his hand, just a dog and a cat. So the ward sister arranged to have his dog brought in to keep him company. It was against the rules. But the need to do the right thing by the old man was more important for her, so she went ahead and broke them. 
She got into trouble for it, but said she'd do it again if it was the right thing for the patient. Sorry, and I just clicked through too much. She said she'd do it again if it was the right thing for her patient. So I just want to show you whether, let's just look at where the sentence breaks are there. There's a short sentence to begin with, an even shorter one, then a longer one, then another short one, then a kind of moderately long one, then the longest one of all, and then a short one, and then a medium one. So it's not short, 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 short. It's not long, 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 long. It, it's a sort of ebb and flow. And by reading it out loud, which I can't stress enough, you know, if you want to develop your, your voice, you really need to get into the habit of reading your copy out loud and listening to how it sounds. You can feel where those uh, pauses ought to come. I have to say, you know, you have to be hot with punctuation. You have to be great with uh, commas as well as full stops. Um, but that's a great uh, way to keep your reader interested and on the hook. So let's move on um, to talk about musicality in a little more depth. Musicality is all about patterns, much more about the sound of the writing rather than the structure or the shape of it. Um, you know, there are lots of different things we could talk about here. I just want to pick two. The first one is alliteration and the second one is rhymes. Um, as you know, you know, alliteration is the repeated initial syllable, uh, initial letter, or to be honest, the repeated initial sound of the initial letter. Um, if you say something like sing a song of sixpence, that's far too obvious in, in copy or anything like it. Um, but if you said something, if you were doing you know, luxury cars or train travel, and you said if there's a softer seat on the market, we'd be surprised, that's not so obvious. And it does have this, and it should be subconscious, a subconscious pleasurable aspect to it. We don't really want to be drawing attention to what we're doing in terms of the technical tricks. But if we are subtle about the way we use them, we're building up this this pleasurable experience as they uh, as the reader reads and and they feel minded to keep going. Uh, so let me show you an example which I kind of uh, I, I found online writing um, when I was writing persuasive copywriting. It's from Singapore Airlines, and it's just this first line really: the the new first class seat is your private and exclusive sanctuary in the sky. In fact, it's, it's rhythmic as well. It's not just that we have alliteration. It's, it's also a really nice bit of ryth rhythm. And in fact, we've got this S under exclusive sanctuary in the sky and first class seat. So there's a lot of internal rhymes, uh, internal uh, sound rhymes, sorry, where we're, we're just repeating that S sound. Um, I'm not sure about what I think about this, this rhyme of atmosphere and stratosphere, but certainly as far as alliteration goes, I think it works really well. So let's just move on. Um, we're still with musicality, but I want to talk about the, the, the other half of, of the sort of equation, which is to do with rhymes. Now, I think if you have um, complete rhymes, you know, I'm so much in love, like a hand in a glove, it, that's great for songwriting, uh, maybe even for poetry these days. It's far too much of an effect is far too visible and audible for copy or, or content writers you know, you know or, or fiction you know for that matter or essay writing it calls too much attention to itself uh, so so the pattern obscures rather than complements the meaning but if you rhyme internal uh, sounds in words so that's this is called assonance you can create something really memorable really sticky you know, it's very, very effective. So I want to show you a few uh, examples of that in advertising. First of all, you know, a classic from uh, Heinz, Beans Means Heinz. So we've got this lovely ns kind of sounds. It's unusual to get assonance with, with consonants, but, but not completely uh, unheard of. And you've got that internal Beans Means, which is also a, a, a kind of rhyme in its own right. Then the next one is, is Gillette, which uh, allegedly is the best a man can get. And again, we're rhyming straightforwardly Gillette and get, but within the slogan, you've got that short E sound in best and get, and actually in man and, and can. So even within what's that, a six word slogan, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. Um, really nice, uh, succinct copywriting. And even shorter, a three word slogan here from Jaguar, born to perform, which is an almost perfect rhyme, but in, in fact, strictly speaking, it's just assonance on that or sound. So moving away from 
patterns for a moment. What I want to talk about in tip four is a much more kind of novelistic technique. This is something I've got to grips with in the last year, but I've always played around with it for, for copy. And it's you know what I would call sensory language. Now, a lot of us, uh, when we're writing about products, particularly the more abstract or kind of hard-nosed business-to-business type of products, you know, or if you're writing about pensions, which, which I do uh, from time to time for Prudential, you get into very abstract sort of intellectual high register language. It's very sterile. There's nothing to do for the reader but to understand the meaning, but they can't really grab a hold of it. So these are the five questions that I like to ask. You know, what does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it taste, sound, and feel like? Um, and I was talking to a marketing manager at this uh, pensions company the other day, saying, and she said, "Well, how do we say what it, what it, you know, what does a pension smell like?" And I was saying, "Well, well supposing you start your copy by saying, you know, picture the scene. It's the first day of your retirement." for the first time in 30 years, you can mow the lawn on a Monday morning instead of getting the train to work. Smell that new mown grass and so on and so forth. So life with a product, for example, doesn't have to be a description of the product at all. Uh, people are much more interested in how their own lives are going to be experienced in the future. And when you solve a problem with a particular product, maybe that's an opportunity to bring in some of this uh, sensory language. What I'd like to do for you is to just, just read you a very, very short extract from um, Trigger Point, which is the first thriller I published this time, uh, well, about six months ago, actually, last, last October. Um, the, the, the scene is a Hells Angels clubhouse. Gabriel Wolfe is this ex-Special Forces soldier who's gone to uh, conduct a bit of business. Uh, and we sort of right at the top where these Hells Angels emit high-pitched giggling and throaty rumbles, liquid with cigarette smoke and years spent breathing road dust. Who did you think I was, boy? Brad Pitt. This set off another riot of hooting and cawing. Gabriel decided to take the initiative back. No, you're far too good looking. Meeks paused for a split second and scratched his chin. Funny guy, huh? Yes, I am Davis Meeks. Why don't you come inside, have a beer, and we can talk business? Meeks slung a heavy arm around Gabriel's shoulders and walked him into the shadowy interior of the clubhouse. Gabriel tends for a blast of the other man's sweat, but instead got a blast of citrus overlaid with aftershave. He just never knew. So there's quite a lot of sensory uh, language going on in this. We, we have the high-pitched giggling and the throaty rumbles, which are kind of auditory. And it carries on with this idea of it being liquid with cigarette smoke and breathing road dust, which starts to become a kind of tangible uh, feeling word, if you like. Then we have some hooting and cawing, which is sort of evoking monkeys and crows. And I, then uh, another kind of feeling word to do is scratching a chin. So this great kind of scarred neo-Nazi hell's angel takes a very uh, slight uh, Gabriel Wolf inside. And we have this phrase here where he, he, sling, he slung a heavy arm around Gabriel's shoulders and we feel the weight of that muscle's tattooed arm. The interior is shadowy, not just dark. Uh, and instead of sweat, we get citrus. So contrasting those two very sort of definite kind of sensory ideas. Um, it's fun to do. Uh, it has a place in copywriting definitely and you don't see it a great deal which means if you can develop that part of your voice you've got a real uh, point of difference with 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 the crowd so that's the uh, fourth one to do with sensory language Let, let's talk about another uh, technique and this is repetition that uh, another kind of pattern making in writing it's great for reinforcing your point and it works really well as what rhetoricians you know greek rhetoricians would have called a tricolon or a triad um, and I want to, sorry, I've slightly lost my place, just want to give you an example uh, of a group of three. This is uh, Julius Caesar, Vini, Vidi, Vici, which means I came, I saw, I conquered. If you don't repeat in threes, you can repeat uh, small parts of, of phrases. So here's John F. Kennedy's 61 inaugural speech, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Uh, and in 20, uh, Nelson Mandela um, said this, many people in this country have paid the price before me and many will pay the price after me. 
and you could even think if you were recruiting uh, copywriters you might say this in an email are you a copywriter a copywriter who's going places a copywriter with drive guts and ambition and here's an example from a sales letter that I wrote uh, for the Economist magazine and it's just this this little bit at the top where we have do you believe that it's important to know more about our world do you know the difference between an opinion and an informed opinion do you feel that the pursuit of knowledge is a valuable activity so we have this do you do you do you and we go from believe to know to feel uh, incidentally I mean I chose the questions very carefully so only an idiot would say no um, so it's a sort of a, a trick question really to get somebody nodding and there were other you know if we had time we could go through the rest of this lesson there was an awful lot of all of these techniques going on the sixth tip I want to talk about um, is precision um, what we're looking for is to add meaning to our writing as we lengthen the sentence it's not just emphasis you know this is what I was t taught really that um, adjectives and adverbs you know those lovely describing words um, they feel delicious as we write them or speak them but they don't often convey very much except our own excitement so here's a sort of typical line you would get from a, a sort of nature charity save the Siberian tiger and then the copywriter thinks well you know I need to kind of I need to pump this up a bit and now it becomes save the magnificent Siberian tiger which is being cruelly hunted and like well what's magnificent about it and as opposed to being kindly hunted so those words don't really do uh, any good at all so we then do this save the magnificent Siberian tiger which is being cruelly hunted and is in terrible danger uh, again this is the I, I see this all the time with with charity clients that their, their own emotions are, are coming out onto the page of the screen it's what I call emoting not evoking but we need to do a bit of editing because some of these words aren't adding anything except emphasis and it's these three really we need to take out magnificent we need to take out cruelly and we need to take out terrible so now it reads save the Siberian tiger which is being hunted and is in danger now that you may feel this still lacks a bit of poetry but it has more impact so what can we do next how about this save the last 200 Siberian tigers so we add detail which are being hunted by poachers with Kalashnikovs so now we're adding specificity and precision to the language and are in immediate danger of extinction so we're saying the time scale for the danger and what is the particular kind of danger and that's another way of I think in terms of finding your voice it comes from research incidentally this doesn't come from imagination uh, the more you can find out about your subject the more uh, resources you have as a writer to be able to pick and choose the words you use another way of being precise is to write like a journalist and I want to tell you a quick story I was driving home from a, a meeting one day and I heard a, a piece by a female journalist who was just walked into a, a kind of prison camp I think it was one of uh, the sort of Middle Eastern dictators who've been overthrown and, and and this is what she what she said there is another body in front of me a man he's dead kneeling with his head twisted sideways on the ground and his hands tied behind his back with wire there is a fist sized hole in the back of his head a lot of blood the smell is bad everywhere these were assassinations murders you know I I nearly had to pull over I mean she was breathing very shallowly you know this was in real time she was walking amongst this dreadful scene of uh, carnage and violence um, I don't think or if there are adjectives in that sentence you hardly notice them I suppose fist size is one it came from the the precision and and sparseness of the language backed by this immersion uh, in in the scene and the very carefully chosen words and and you can see in terms of pacing and rhythm now she's speaking in, and I don't suppose she's particularly rehearsed it but you can see what a natural uh, communicator is it, she is in, in her language so lastly um, in my tips 
I'm aware that we're kind of cantering through them, is, is this great tip from sort of every fiction tutor ever, a show don't tell. Um, this, I love this quote from Anton Chekhov, the Russian short story writer and a playwright. Don't tell me it was night, show me the moon reflected in a shard of broken glass. And I consciously practice this technique, almost stealing it literally when I'm writing novels. Um, it's such a great thing. It, it stretches your writing muscles. You know, and the classic is the lazy writer who says, I'm, I'm writing to you about an exciting new development. That's telling and it's completely cliche telling as that. What you really want to do is to show somebody the development that you're excited about. So I'll, I'll, I'll close with a couple of examples. This first one is telling. This thousand thread count Egyptian cotton bed linen is the height of luxury. Or we could say, run your fingers over the satin smooth surface of this thousand thread count Egyptian cotton bed linen and feel the difference. Now that's showing, people can picture it, they can imagine themselves there. Or this one, creating a perpetual motion machine has baffled and eluded inventors for centuries. You know, that's true. Uh, it's just not very involving. Or we say the, the puzzle of perpetual motion has been furrowing inventors' brows since Archimedes was playing with his rubber ducky in the bath, and that's showing. So that's it. That's my quick canter through seven uh, tips for finding your voice and developing it as a writer. And Greg, I hope we've got some questions to, to answer. All right, Andy, thank you so much for that. That was really interesting, I think. A lot to think about there, really cool seven tips. Um, I'd like everybody now, if you have questions, to make sure you type those into the chat box, um, or you can send them through Twitter, but if you're here, uh, chat me in a question. If you want Andy to clarify about any of the tips, um, go a little further. Oh, actually, Andy, can you um, enlarge oh, that? sorry. Yeah. Let's go back. <laughs> and can we go back to the last slide again? Yeah, 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 sorry about that, everyone. Oh, no worries. Um, quick run through it again, a reminder. A lot of information there, so if there's there anything that you want to hear more about, be sure to chat us in. Um, in the meantime, I'll say let's make sure we stay in touch. Obviously, you can follow Andy on Twitter, at Andy Maslin. Follow me, chat with me on Twitter, Greg or Hunt, uh, at Writer Access as well. Um, you can email me, Greg at Writer Access, and I definitely encourage you to check out Andy's website and his uh, his work. So Can I just interrupt? Sorry, Greg, and sorry, yeah, everybody. Please. That, that uh, personal site is my author site. That, there's an there's extra dot in the middle. It's not andy.maslin.com. It's just andymaslin.com. But we can change that, I guess, on the slides before you send them out. Yeah, I think, actually, does Google read those? I think I might just ignore those and treat it like it's nothing. I'm not really sure about that, but I think, okay, I think well, they'd probably we'll be okay if we go to that. But. <laughs> Find Andy. Google Andy Maslin. He's pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll, that'll do it. <laughs> um, just to start off, I, I wonder, I'd like to hear more about your fiction writing. We talked a little bit about this before we got on, but I think it's really interesting how you're transitioning. You've been doing the copywriting, and now you have four or five books out. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and where you see that going and you know how you got into that? Well, it, you know, it's an interesting story. I was, uh, you know, for years, you know, 20 odd years, I've been preaching that um, I am, you know, that we are not creative. So, you know, we are uh, salesmen who happen to, or women who happen to use the written word. Um, you know, I used to write poetry at school and some short fiction, but I always said, no, I'm not a writer, I'm a copywriter. And then uh, on vacation last year, my wife said to me, you know, the difference between us is you're a writer who runs a business agency, and I'm a business agency director who sometimes writes. And it was as if someone had kind of, you know, the big golden pointing finger came out of the sky. And when we got home, I picked up a notebook and I scribbled out about 3,000 words longhand of the beginning of this novel, Trigger Point. And it just flooded out, you know, 120,000 word first draft in about six weeks. Uh, I immediately started the second one um, and the third, and just today typed the end on the, the fourth in this series. You know, I write I write for a couple of hours every day at minimum. You know, I get up at 6 a.m. and write uh, for an hour. I write on the train. You know, I write uh, you know, in the evenings. And it's been a completely sort of transforming experience for me. I mean, I'm still doing the copywriting uh, in, in sort of office hours uh, if there's writing to be done. But I have to say, the, you know, having sort of tasted the sweet honey of writing fiction, <laughs> and, you know, I've always been a long-form 
writer, you know, I've cut my teeth writing direct mail, but there's something incredibly liberating about writing a sort of, you know, six figure manuscript because you don't have to condense everything down into short sentences, paragraphs, sections, whatever. You don't have to write, I mean, people do write novels in plain English, but you don't have to. Uh, you can go wherever you want to go with it. Uh, as long as the reader turns the next page, you're allowed to do it, you know? So it's, it's kind of cool, you know, it's kind of parallel career at the moment. Did you find it hard to break the habits, these, you know, uh, writing things short, being concise, the, the things you learn in copywriting, did you find it hard to kind of transition over to being a novelist? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, when I look at the first novel and compare it to the one I've just finished, you can see how I've loosened up, if you like, uh, in, in, as a stylist. You know, the first one was almost written like ad copy, you know, lots of short sentences, lots of sentences without verbs in, and actually in the editing process and, and redrafting, I, I kept seeing all this stuff and said, that's, you know, don't worry. People don't think this is junk mail. You don't have to keep rattling along. You can afford to take your time and, and pause to describe something, um, you know, and, and just, just sort of loosen up a bit like the tips we've been talking about today. You know, you're still aware of, I mean, pacing and rhythm and all of these kind of things I was talking about. But I've always said, you know, as a trainer, the difference between copy and, let's say, fiction is nobody buys copy. You know, copy is an interruption, it's junk mail, it's spam, it's trash, it's marketing speak. If somebody buys a novel, even if it's just for a few dollars or pounds, they, they literally have invested in it. And for that reason, they are, they, they see it as the product in itself. You know, it is an artifact, it has, it has worth, it has intrinsic uh, value to them, which means they are, I think, a more forgiving reader. You, if you start going all poetical when you're selling life insurance, people are going to delete immediately. Uh, if they've paid to read a thriller, they, uh, and you, as long as you thrill them, obviously, um, you can loosen up. So yes, you know, it, it, it's been a pretty steep learning curve over the last sort of 12, 13 months. Yeah, that's interesting. So I, I was thinking about something um, I saw this morning on the news. There was a story about IT workers here in the US um, basically being forced to train their replacements abroad and being replaced or and in the future possibly being replaced by you know like uh, computers or something like that or bots as you mentioned and you talked yeah. a little bit in the beginning of the um, presentation about the importance of writing as a job and sort of its place I wonder you know you've had a long and interesting career um, just what your kind of experience has been and how writing has changed and its place as a job as a career and how where you think it might be going oh sure um, yeah yeah just thoughts on um, that. It's, it's all good news it's all good news I mean I I would say it's never been it's never been more important as a job I mean where you know if I, if I go back um, never do the math 1986 was that 30 years ago uh, you know I used to use freelance copywriters from time to time but you know it, it, I, I it, didn't have that same flavor that the whole content industry didn't exist, which I know you guys at Writer Access are very involved with. Um, you know, there are people who are tone of voice experts. You know, I read an amazing statistic the other day about the, the UK market for tone of voice it was going to be something like 126 million next year. And, you know, I don't think they meant writing tone of voice. I just think they meant, you know, commissioning tone of voice guidelines from consultants. So, you know, with every new platform, with every new um, piece of hardware, you suddenly get another avenue for text for companies to, I mean, think of social. Now, now every company on the planet has a social team and they all have to write in the company's tone of voice, they have to think of things to say, they have to write blog posts to link to. If you can string a sentence together and make it emotionally engaging and grammatically correct and all the rest of it, the, you know, you will never starve. I mean, I... Uh, if you can get your pricing right, which is probably the subject of another webinar, but you know, we, we make a, a very comfortable living as writers. I mean, I, I'm doing the job I was doing when I was 24. I'm essentially a highly paid marketing assistant now. All I do is write uh, and talk about writing. You know, I don't have to employ people or manage them. So I would say yes. You know. All the naysayers and do doomsday people, who's the Cassandras, who say, "Oh well, you know, bots are going to do this, and you can get a complete website on Fiverr for five bucks." I mean, it's always been the case you get what you pay for. Uh, I have clients who, if you said, "I'll oh, write a website for five bucks," would would kind of show you the door in a very short order. So you pick your place in the market, 
and you price yourself accordingly and, and you head for it and you market yourself. Um, I, I wouldn't ever be worried about offshoring or bots or anything else. I mean, there was an article in this last week's Economist talking about the, the column called Johnson about the advantages of being an English speaker or writer because it's the de facto global language, uh, you know, of, of business, of the internet, of everything else. So I would say learn your chops, do your marketing, get your pricing right, and as I said, you will never starve and you will have a great time. You know, I love, I love getting up to go to work. You know, it's barely discernible the difference between work and play for me. It's, you know, somebody said to me the other day, we get paid to do our hobby. <laughs> That's great, yeah. So I wonder, you know, you're very established and you, like you said, you've been doing this for decades. Would you have any advice for newer writers who are looking to kind of begin their, their writing career? Where do they start? Obviously, you said, you know, learning your craft. But as far as marking themselves, um, just getting into that world, what, what could you suggest? Oh well, if we yeah, let, let's let's divide. Let's assume that, that, that this person, John or Jane, is there is gonna you know this is somebody who can write, or they're gonna be able to very shortly. They're gonna read the right books, do the right creative courses or exercises, go on courses, get themselves a mentor. I think. It's, it's actually remarkably simple. What you have to do is make a list of companies whose brands you admire and write to the marketing director and say, I love your brand and I would like to write copy for you. And if that doesn't work, ring them up. And if that doesn't work, go and stand outside their house with a, with a sandwich board <laughs> when they're leaving for work saying, Mr. Hunt, I love your brand. I want to work for you. I love it so much I'll work for nothing. Please give me a go. And the, the writer with chutzpah, to use that Yiddish word, they get the gigs. You know, you can sit on, on your backside all day and tweet and do social and, you know, create infographics about the five ways to use an apostrophe. And I think you can kid yourself as a freelancer that that's marketing, but you will, uh, you will starve. Or you can go very sort of 19th century or early 20th, pick up the phone get some face time with somebody you know I used to be a marketing director you know they're, they're lovely people they usually got a mountain of problems and if you come along and say I know you've got a mountain of problems and one of them is nobody in your team can write copy but I can great they say what can you do when can you start <laughs> but I, I think you have to hustle you know it's a confidence issue and I've interviewed and spoke to lots and lots of copywriters in every stage of their career but for the People kind of starting out often it is a big confidence issue how you get around that um, you know there are ways to do it um, but again you know if you want to start your own business if you want to be an entrepreneur if you want people to pay you without employing you you've got to have the confidence I mean it's one of those things you can't sort of be self-employed and whiny at the same time you you know you you kind of paid your money and made your choice so you're going to start your own business you've got to be your own salesperson or if you're not going to do that partner with somebody who's going to be your salesperson and work out a revenue sharing deal they bring in the money and you do the writing it's called setting up an ad agency basically you know they always used to have three people you'd have an art director a writer and an account person and and you would just like Bartle Bogle Hegarty, classic example over here. Three guys set up an ad agency, and they had the three talents. Um, but that's you know that that's my big tip is, is is write to people you want to work for, and remember to you know remember to sell. Remember to explain to them what the benefits not of hiring a freelancer, which too many freelancers do. You know there are hundreds of freelancers' websites who say things like, "This is why f copywriting is so difficult, and why you should hire a writer," but they forget to say why you should hire me. So it's kind of putting the lessons into practice on your own account, really. In and I, you know, I get things thrown at me for suggesting this, but the more old school you go, the more work you're going to get. If, so if you send somebody a handwritten letter on cream laid paper and you handwrite the envelope and you put a postage stamp on it, I guarantee it will get at least as far as the PA of the CMO if not the CMO themselves. Because no, who writes correspondence these days? I saw it quoted the other day as the caviar of written communication, a handwritten letter. <laughs> so, you know, invest a little bit of time, uh, make yourself stand out with something that looks like it came from another century, and it will get opened. I like that, go analog. 
Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm super analog. I'm kind of old school. Very cool. Uh, another question I'm seeing, a, a theme of, you know, how do you deal with revisions? From right from clients and, and notes in general, you know, like sort of the big question as a writer: if you really love your craft and you yeah. think you've done a great job, what's your kind of take on that philosophy? Okay, brilliant question. Whoever asked that, um, I've been I, doing this a long time, as you know, and I still get it, and it still makes me want to go out and kill something. <laughs> um, so, generally speaking, I would use the advice I got given as a new parent, which is pick your battles. Uh, in the early days, as far as I was concerned, the battle was everything. Every single revision was a was a problem because if it wasn't, you know, perfect, why had I written it? Um, and then you learn that that doesn't get you very far. And I divide up the revisions into things that I think will make a difference to the results, and things that I think will only make a difference to the aesthetics. If I think they'll only make a difference to the aesthetics, I'll push back a little bit. But if the client says, well, I really want it like this, then I do it. If I think it's going to have a material effect on the results, then I dig my heels in and I will explain at length why it's a bad idea. And the way I sell it is I say, listen, you know, I don't have a retainer. The only way I get repeat business is if people like what happens. What you're proposing I don't think is going to give you the results you want. And you're not going to turn around and blame yourself. You're going to blame me. That's why I'm arguing in favor of it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And in the end, I say, well, okay, fine. You're the client. We'll do it your way. But then it goes into the money pile, not into the portfolio pile. It becomes a job of work. I just want to get the money and get out of it and preferably not work for them again and find a more sympathetic client. Um, it's no consolation to younger or less experienced writers, but I found that the more expensive and old I get, the less I have to worry about revisions. You know, and I say to people, I'm a very expensive dog to have and bark yourself. That seems to work sometimes, and they laugh. Um, but I still have. I had a, an email I wrote for a client the other day, and it was a, a young marketeer, probably less than half my age, had deleted in track changes everything between Dear Mr. Sample and Yours Sincerely. <laughs> and, and there was the deathless comment, please write something different. <laughs> so you're like, well, okay, fine. You know, <laughs> Anything but this. You know, it's, what do you do? You know, that sort of thing just used to leave me seething, but I, now I just kind of laugh and think, well, fine, okay, I'll, you know, I'll write something different. It's not the end of the world. Nobody died, and I will put you into a novel in the future, and you will be horribly tortured by African warlords. So, I get, you know, I'll have That's my how you get your revenge in fiction. Yeah, right? yeah absolutely. They, they always end up <laughs> off a cliff or getting run over or something. Um, so, I would say it's grace under pressure. You know, you, you've got to you've got to respect the client. You know, we have a poster in our office that I wrote and designed. It says, "Be nice to clients; they pay for everything." And I do really believe that that's that's the that's the truth of it. If if you if you don't want your copy revised, you know, write fiction and publish it yourself. But then you've got to hire an editor, if you, unless you're an idiot. And if they suggest revisions, then what are you going to do? I mean, it's 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 that's the thing. It's, that is part of the process. I think that none of us knows everything. And if you get the right editor, or let's say the right client, they can sometimes make very sensible suggestions that you perhaps have noticed. So I think it's a kind of a two-way street, really. I will say to people, if you don't know why I did something, please ask, because I can explain it. And if you don't like something, please explain what it is you don't like and why. So we try and get it out of the subjective emotional realm and into the objective intellectual realm where we can look at it and say, if this page was a machine and the, dis the purpose of the machine was this, which bits of it aren't making the purpose happen properly, like a car engine, and what can we do to fix it? So it's that really, but because it's writing and everyone has an aesthetic opinion, that's why I think you get into those horrible teeth grinding conversations. <laughs> Certainly is. Well, I think that's a good place to leave it with teeth grinding conversations about revision that always <laughs> always comes back but thank you so much for the great advice Andy. Um, love the tips I think those are really really helpful um, I encourage everybody to you know reach out to Andy follow him on Twitter check out his website read his books uh, really really great to have you on I appreciate it yeah thanks a lot Craig thanks everyone <laughs>